So thank you again for, for coming this evening. Uh, you, you talked a lot about the urgency of, of climate change and fighting climate change. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your, your personal background and how your time first at P&G, then at Unilever, shaped your view on climate change and the need to fight climate change. And on the flip side, how the challenges of sustainability and climate change have shaped your opinion on the role of a responsible executive in this space? So uh, there, there are two questions really, but um, I've always uh, in my whole career, irrespective of the company I work for, be it Nestle or now Unilever, uh, been uh, interested in, in helping others succeed if you want to. And uh, climate change is really a uh, development agenda, as I mentioned today. So it's often the poor that suffer the most, and where you have this enormous development, uh, where you need to lift people out of poverty in many of these emerging markets, uh, climate change is becoming a constraint, and you're starting to see that already. Uh, Unilever obviously has brought an extra dimension to this, and as a CEO, uh, my involvement is a little bit higher, first of all, from my position as CEO, but which brings responsibilities with it but also because we're in the food business for example and then you get very quickly involved in agriculture or food security but then if you go in the whole value chain you also get involved in let's say the issues of deforestation and these are major contributors to climate change and uh, you cannot run away from that the role of the ceo is drastically changing because uh, of the responsible ceo if i may say there are probably some that will never change like in any profession but business is starting to see that it becomes increasingly difficult to operate in an environment that doesn't function. So that gets the interest of a lot of people. And I think responsible business also understands the difficulties of the current political climate. Many of the global governance issues in a very interdependent world were handled by institutions in the past that, that functioned well because most of the economy was in Europe and the US. And these were the institutions that were created during Bretton Woods. Now the world is truly globalized. You have 50% of your economy now outside of Europe and the US. Soon that will be 60, 70%. And frankly, our global governance has not adjusted very well. So you need to really, as a businessman, be more responsible and be in there and help de-risk that political process. So you do get more involved now in the intersections between politics, uh, civil society, and business if you really want to create the right environment for everybody to succeed, including business. Thank you, do you want to you sure. jump yes, in? Yes, I have a second question. So, as a consumer-facing company, Unilever will have to ask its consumers, ultimately, in order to meet its sustainability goals, to change their behavior. So I'm wondering how you approach that difficult task of, of asking consumers to do that. So, in reality, uh, consumers are changing behaviors faster than we sometimes realize. I just recently gave a talk to the marketing community and one of my messages to them was you're falling behind. It used to be that we were leading and shaping consumer habits, but now I think the consumers are. You take the US where we are right now, in the food industry, which is a difficult industry, the fastest growing segments, in fact 80% of the growth is in products that are organic or bio or neighborhood farms and you see these products coming in with an enormous speed. A change is happening. People are looking for cleaner labels. You see carbonate markets going down. You see people eating healthier food. And th these are consumers that are changing faster than many companies because a lot of these companies are struggling with that if you look at the results they report. You see that also because of, of, of occurrences, like when you have a drought in Brazil or a drought in California or a drought in Australia, all of them happened in the last two years. You see consumers adapting very quickly. And, and coping with habits. In the UK, a country where I live, one of the fastest growing uh, segments is fair trade. Now, what we need to do as organizations is to be sure that we give consumers quicker options than they are looking for alternatives, otherwise we are out of business. So our innovation program is very important. For example, we have now uh, in, in Brazil, where you don't have, because of the drought, you don't have water, we have waterless shampoos, we have detergents that use less water. We have ice cream that has higher uh, freezing temperatures, so it uses less energy. So we try to bring our innovation program uh, up to the levels that obviously drive these consumer habits. Then we work with consumers themselves, we have programs of habit change. 
how to wash your hands with less water but have a better performing product, how to take less showers and other things. So I think in everything we do, we have to take this lens of sustainability or in the topic that we talk, uh, climate reduction. Uh, on a similar topic, you mentioned in your, your discussion earlier this evening that climate change can actually create big uh, business opportunities. Uh, and in, you spoke specifically about Unilever. I wonder if you, could, if you can give an example of, of how it has driven opportunity for Unilever or how it can in the future drive opportunity for innovation and business. Uh, for example, uh, you take uh, food, if I may stay with food again, climate change gives enormous volatilities in food prices, but also in, in an availability of the crop. If you are dependent for tomatoes on California and all of a sudden there's a big drought, you don't have tomatoes, you don't sell your products. So we have moved much quicker into sustainable sourcing. We are leading that for the world. We have about 60% of our agriculturally based materials sustainably sourced now. We have more partnerships with governments to set up alternative sourcing. We work with NGOs to help train these small, uh, small holder farmers in sustainable agriculture. Uh, we're creating a much stronger ecosystem that takes our risk away but it also creates enormous opportunities to broaden our products because once you work in partnerships, often with governments or with civil society, it creates other opportunities to grow your business. We look at uh, products that are, otherwise we would not uh, be able to sell these products, like the waterless shampoos is a, is a, is a wonderful example uh, that gets us into different types of businesses we probably otherwise wouldn't get into. Uh, we look at technologies in our own value chain. We have uh, all of our factories are green energy. Our, all of our offices now are actually contributing to the grid. It's not only that they are green, we are now looking at offices that need to give a positive contribution. And all of a sudden we find that it is actually more economical to run it, that our employees are more motivated, that then ultimately gets again translated back into a healthier business result. Uh, with our retailers, the same thing. The consumers are demanding it, so retailers want to work more with companies that are responsible. So from wherever you look at, from your value chain with your suppliers, from your cost structure, from your motivation with your employees, from your innovation program, there is an angle of positive growth that is connected to this. And in your conversations with your colleagues and other um, offices with CEOs, do they share this view? Uh, and I wonder if you can walk us through some of the conversations you've had with, with your colleagues at, at other organizations and other companies. What are the challenges that, that they, they bring up in, in these conversations and whether or not they will or will not implement programs towards climate change? Well, I have never met a CEO uh, that wants more unemployment, that wants more climate change, that wants more poverty. So in essence, uh, people uh, all want to achieve that same objective. Uh, the question often is what are the forces we're under? Sometimes the pressures that uh, people have on their business models, especially when, when the economy is not doing well, the short-term pressures from the financial markets, the short-term tenures of CEOs, uh, there are many factors that get in the way. The issue of climate change is even more difficult because you often deal with experts or pressure from the outside that you are not expert with to or have the knowledge to deal with and it's more difficult to get people engaged but uh, that's not my problem I think what we try to do is create coalitions of like-minded people that are able to create a tipping point you take palm oil you only need a, a few uh, companies like Cargill or uh, or uh, Wilmar in Indonesia a few users of the palm oil and a few countries that produce the palm oil with some financial institutions like the World Bank or, or others to sit together, not more than 30 people, to create this tipping point. And once you create a tipping point, these other companies will join. Um, that's also why it's so important to get governments involved and get some policy frameworks so that we avoid the free riders. But there is enough critical mass. If you look at the World Economic Forum, where we have a section with consumer goods companies, there are about 100 very progressive. We have the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. There are about 200 companies very progressive or forward thinking. You have the UN Global Compact, which has a special group of, of uh, more advanced companies in there. Uh, there are 8,000 people that are members of the UN Global Compact. So there is enough critical mass. Do you get all companies uh, involved? Do you get them all at the same speed? Do you get that enthusiasm from all the CEOs? Uh, the answer is no, but it's not frankly needed. Uh, many will sign up if you come 
with the right programs. And the proof is, when we were in September in New York and calling for a price on carbon, we had a thousand companies sign up. And that's a good thing because your first commitment needs to be be committed yourself, then sign up, and then drive these transformations into your company. And it's starting to work. 70% of the major companies have CSR programs. They report CSR. Uh, about 200 out of the top 500 companies have uh, climate, uh, carbon reduction plans in their companies that are more than the 6% per year needed. 50 of the top 200 have internal prices for carbon. There are even 35 companies that want to be ca carbon neutral by 2050. So there are enough showing that it can be done. And as we create more awareness around these companies, get more data, I think we will also create a critical mass to drive the change. I, I know you mentioned this earlier, but I'd love to, to dive a little bit deeper. I wonder if you could just paint what success and failure would look like in Paris for you as a company, uh, for you as a leader on climate change and, and, and you personally. Yeah, so I don't start from the uh, premise of failure in Paris, it's going to be a success. There will be an agreement uh, in the COP21 in December. The question is how ambitious is that agreement? And we need to spend all of our time to make that agreement as ambitious as possible. What does that mean? It means that there is a clearly defined target that we need to all align. Carbon neutral by the end of the century or uh, cutting uh, half of our carbon emission by 2050 or in my case be even more aggressive. What is the overall objective? Secondly, a commitment that, uh, uh, that we will look at pricing of carbon because if we start to put a price on carbon, we will galvanize a faster change. It will not come out of Paris, but at least make the commitment. The third one is a financing mechanism because you need to figure out also uh, the developed markets have to help these emerging markets make these transitions. And there is a financing mechanism that needs to happen. Also a financing mechanism towards the uh, private sector. And then the fourth element is enough public-private partnerships to scale some of these initiatives fast. Yeah? And that's the success of Paris. Now, ultimately, it then boils down to individual countries, individual people that have to be held accountable and with clear transparency and measurements to move this forward. Because although we talk a lot now about the agreement in Paris, it's only the first step of a longer road to tackling this issue. Mr. Coleman, thank you so much for your thank time. You for I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity.